Okay, welcome everyone. So, this is a course called games and information. In IIT Bombay, it runs under the course codes SC 631. So, what is this course about? This course is about uh, the theory of games, but with a particular emphasis on issues related to information, information in games. Okay. So, in that regard, there are some other courses also uh, on games, but this, this course is very different in the, in the particular emphasis that it has on the role of information. Okay. So, what I will do is of course, I will not assume any background in games. So, what I will be doing uh, during this course is I will start off from the basics of game theory, introduce you to at least uh, the elementary aspects of static games where information is really trivial and does not play as, as important a role. And then we will ramp up very quickly to games where there is, where information is an, a, a, uh, is an integral part of the uh, game definition and the game solution, all right. Okay. So, to begin with, let us start with the, what is a prototypical example, one of the sort of famous games that uh, is often referred to in uh, in uh, books on game theory and and uh, even in popular uh, popular literature which is the game called prisoner's dilemma now, what is the prisoner's dilemma prisoner's dilemma has a has a the following situation so there are two prisoners that are held in solitary confinement they have both been convicted or uh, they have both been suspected let's say of a crime okay uh, now, they, they have been held in solitary confinement and the judge offers them a, uh, a certain uh, deal, you can say. The judge offers them a deal which is, which is to say that, well, you can, if you want to, you can testify against the other prisoner. Okay. So, there are, let us say, two prisoners, prisoners, prisoner A and prisoner B. And the judge offers them the following deal that if you testify against the other prisoner, then you, so you have the option to testify against the other prisoner. Okay. Now, based on what happens uh, in the sense that based on what both uh, both prisoners do, you will get a certain number of years in jail. That is going to that will determine your punishment. So that so if I have to write out how many years in jail uh, you are going to get, it can be written it uh, written out in a sort of like a matrix like this. So. The prisoners have the option to testify, so they can either testify or stay silent. So, if prisoner A stays silent, so he has two options to stay silent or to testify. And likewise, prisoner B also has the option to stay silent or to testify against the other prisoner. Okay. And the deal is like this. So, now if both of you remain silent, okay, then neither testifies against the other then both of you would get one year in jail. Okay, so, the way I have written this is 1 comma 1 which means the, the, the first term here is the, uh, is this the first one here is the number of years in jail for A and uh, who is on the rows here and, uh, and the second term here is the number of years in jail for, for B who is on the columns. Okay. So, if they both stay silent then uh, they each get one year in jail. If one of them stays silent and the other testifies, okay. So, in this case, for example, I am now writing if A testifies and B stays silent. Now, if A testifies and B stays silent, then the one who testifies goes free. So, he gets 0 years in jail and the one who stays silent gets 3 years in jail. Now, we can of course, debate on whether this is fair or not fair on, and so on, but that is not uh, our uh, mandate here. We, we want to, we want to be able to reason about this situation. That is the, uh, that is what we want to do. So, symmetrically here, so naturally now if A stays silent and B testifies against A, then A will get 3 years in jail and B will go, uh, will go free. And then uh, the judge says that if both testify, then both of you would get 2 years in jail. Okay, so, if each testifies against the other, then the, then each of you would get, get 2 years in jail. Now, this is a, an example of a game. So, why, what is special about this? You can see the, the, the first, first thing you notice is that 
no player can a player obviously has a clear objective here which is that he wants to get as few years in jail as possible but there is no the objective is not well defined for him because the it depends the number of years he will get in jail depends also on what the other one does so the the number of years in jail that a player gets depends not just on what he chooses to do but also what on what the other player chooses and this is the same this is this is the case for each player so consequently there is an a linking of decisions that is happening here where neither player can decide what he can do without taking into account what the other player is also going to do all right but then remember the assumption that we started with we started with the assumption that these players are held in solitary confinement which means that they don't have the option to discuss between themselves on what their strategy is going to be right so this is a classic example of a game now you might think that this is something uh, something very uh, contrived or artificial but this is exactly how uh, decision making happens when say competing firms try to decide what their strategies are going to be or two uh, you know two generals from opposing armies would try to decide how they want to how their what their strategies are going to be and this is exactly how the payoff gets played out the reward that one gets depends not only on what you do but also on what the other person does all right now what we want here is to answer certain answer this in a uh, in in some sort of a logical with some kind of a logical framework and that is what the theory of games attempts to do and it attempts to come up with a framework for for reasoning about these situations right so so let me ask you here uh how would you reason about this this problem okay <clears throat> okay very good so there here is one way of reasoning about this and this is uh, what uh, what this is a special structure in this particular problem and it's also one of the reasons to start start off with this problem you can see there is a, the structure here is that if you look at the if you look at the strategy of any one player he has each player has two strategies okay i'll i'll make this for more formal but these are each player has basically two strategies either to stay silent or to or to testify now you compare the corresponding rewards that, that the player would get if he plays one strategy or the other strategy and what you observe is that testifying is always better than staying silent regardless of what the other player does so for example here so if the other player is, is so if b is staying silent then testifying is better than staying silent for a if b is going to testify then again testifying is better than staying silent for a and this uh, this is uh, the situation is symmetric so both uh, so naturally therefore similar uh, similar reasoning can be applied for b also and so consequently it makes sense that both players testify all right so this is one line of reasoning this line of reasoning is essentially saying that uh, what i am looking for is i am looking for a strategy that is uniformly better than all other strategies regardless of what the other player does so in other words i am making the interlinking of decisions irrelevant here right the fact that, that there is another player involved and what the other player is going to do it affects my payoff all of that is becoming irrelevant what is happening what what i am trying to do is find a strategy which which outperforms the other strategies irrespective of what I, what the other guy does now in this that is applicable in this game and that that is applicable because of the way the, these numbers are okay you can imagine a, another type of situation in which firstly where these numbers aren't so aligned in the, such that you know testify will always turn out to be better than the uh, better than staying silent regardless of what the other person does okay that could very well happen i can come up with numbers like that right so your line of reasoning therefore cannot change case by case or game by game you need a universal logic because then it is a logic otherwise it's a hack right you need a logic 
which will be applicable across all games regardless of what the kind of coincidences that are present in the numbers of that particular game, right. So, now tell me what how would you reason about this? No, so, that is that is uh, more or less the same reasoning that you had earlier. So, there is also another uh, subtlety here. So, I am not asking you how you would play this game, ok. So, there are there are two different types of questions we can ask in this in a game. You can ask the following first first question is you can ask the question what what will each player do ok. The emphasis being on the word will ok. The, uh, the other question is you can ask is what must each player do What is the difference between these two? The difference between these two is the what will each player do is asking for a prediction. Uh, I am asking you to predict what each player would do, right. It is like asking you to tell what the future is going to look like, right. It is what will each player do. What must each player do is not asking for a prediction. What must each player do is asking you for what the law is. What should be the right thing for the player to do, ok. So, what we are now in game theory we are not interested in the first question. We do not intend to predict although game theory can be used to predict, but we do not intend to to predict what is going to be the outcome of a game all right. What we can what we can we do not really know what each player would do. I mean, if, if I if I gave you two two different uh, two human prisoners like this or two two armies or two uh, two companies or any of that, we really do not have uh, are in a position are not in a position to say what will each of them do. We can only guess what each of them will do, right? No, not necessarily not necessarily, but the point here is this, this is in fact the subtlety here. What will each player do is really not our business, ok. They may they are they are uh, you know they have free will they may do whatever they want, ok. What or what each player ought to do assuming uh, it assuming a certain set of axioms is what we what we want to try and answer. Right. So, it is in, in, in many ways game theory what it is trying to do is to coming and come up with a sort of a set of laws, a, law, a set of laws and a set of reasoning rules by which we can reason about situations like this ok. So, given those given the bunch of reasoning rules if you follow through those rules you should be able to say what each player must must be doing all right. And hopefully, the answer is sharp enough that it actually tells us that ok, here is exactly this is the precise thing that each player must be doing and therefore, that is what we think is the solution of the game, right. So, now what uh, one of the most of course, popular use cases for game theory is to use it as a prediction, all right. But uh, whether the prediction works or not depends on whether your laws align with the with the situation that is actually prevalent in the game um, or not essentially. Okay, so the so what the uh, the the the, uh, the central quest in the theory of games is not to come up uh, is not to uh, is not to predict. It is rather to reason. Okay, so what what this means is we cannot say what is what will happen. So we confine ourselves to saying what is logical. Okay, so that is and what should be the train of logic is the thing that we are asking ourselves. That is the that that is the uh, that is essentially the question at hand, ok. So, now that we know that this is what we want to answer, we, we would like to ask ok, what what when we, if we want to uh, answer what must each player do, we basically want, would like to see ok, what are the what should be our reasoning rules for this, ok. So, this this requires us to basically set set up a set of axioms, ok. 
one axiom is actually automatic uh, here implicit in this problem formulation for, and that axiom is that each player is looking for the least number of years in J. Okay, so that is that is effectively one axiom, and in fact, this is uh, uh, the this is the underlying basic axiom uh, across all of game theory that there is there is a, there is a a function or a payoff function or a cost function or something like that which each player is is looking to optimize, and the, what what a player is basically interested in is the least value of that particular function. Okay. Now, of course, as I said, this function is not well defined until I also tell you what the other player is, uh, uh, other player is doing. So, it is not really a function, but it is a family of functions that each player has, so, right. The other thing that is implicit in the problem formulation is that each player, was, these, these prisoners were held in solitary confinement, which means that un the underlying assumption here, the axiom here is that players cannot communicate with each other. Right. So, there is no way for players to communicate and or discuss what they what each of them would do right and we and the, the absence of a communication uh, communication medium actually change is is an underlying assumption in this game. So, suppose suppose if I told you so just to see why this is the case suppose if I told you the other case suppose I told you that the players could discuss amongst themselves and come up with come up with a, a strategy on what to do what would they what would they play no let's say they, let's say they want to they the problem is symmetric right so if they want to take say let's say the sum total of the years in jail or something like that so the question is if both players were allowed to communicate with each other Okay, would they necessarily play silent silent okay now in this case that answer is correct but i will tell you there is a subtlety here it could very well happen that both players talk to each other each player convinces the other that i am going to stay silent but when it comes to actually you know pressing the button he the he goes and goes goes back and presses testify having convinced the other person to stay silent No, 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 no. So the so preplay communication, okay, has an important role in this because I I by by talking you into it, it is I could potentially con influence you to stay silent, and then having done that, it then becomes optimal for me to testify. Okay, so. Again, all all the, what this so this is so there is there are two there is there is a subtlety here, which is that just communication is not enough. I can say I am going to stay silent, but what is the guarantee that I will stay silent? Okay, the issue is not just communication. Communication is important, but the, uh, in alongside that, what is also important is a, a mechanism to enforce an agreement. Okay, what is called a binding agreement. Uh, some some mechanism by which which when uh, by which players when they say that this is what they would do they that is what they would actually do okay so if you have such a mechanism okay now that make what such a mechanism means how do you make that formal etc all of that is is part of the theory of games okay and that needs development okay uh, this is uh, this is not a, uh, uh, I am not telling you a sort of sociological story. This is a, this such a thing can actually be made formal. What exactly is such a mechanism? What exactly do we mean by preplay communication? How much is that communication, etc., etc.? All of this can be made formal. But once that is made formal, it does turn out if you give players both the option to communicate with each other and to enter into binding agreements, it then yes, it is indeed the case that players that they should both remain silent. Okay, that is the point on which that is the agreement that they will end up signing, which is that you know I will stay silent and you will also stay silent. Now, the the uh, mechanism to enter into binding agreements requires sometimes a mediator. Okay, so I need to introduce a third player C here, who will be the one that creates these alternatives, gets them to agree, etc., etc., which is 
all of this is too early to, uh, to get into this course at this moment. But, but remember there is this subtlety involved here and what this is also telling you effectively is, is the again the, the, the second thing, the thing that I mentioned about the course which is the role of information. When there is no communication channel between them, the problem is has a very different character from the when the, there is a communication channel between them. Okay, and moreover, when the communication channel passes through a mediator or does not pass through a mediator. All right, all of these are uh, these are this is part of the axioms of a game, of the game. Now, the way I pre presented this particular problem to you, I said that players are obviously self-interested. They would li each like their uh, the least number of years in jail, and that they cannot communicate with each other at all. Okay, so. Actually, if you see the theory of games bifurcates itself into two different categories. So, games can be categorized two, into two broad categories. The first is non-cooperative games. Non-cooperative games means a game is said to be non-cooperative, players have no or players cannot communicate. So, this is when players cannot communicate with each other at all, ok. That is, so the prisoner's dilemma game that you, that I just showed you is a game, uh, is, is a non-cooperative game. The, the other extreme, this is not the, op, uh, not the negation, but the ext another extreme is when there are cooperative games. Cooperative games are when players can communicate with each other. And enter into binding agreements. These are remember two different extremes. They are they are not negation of each other. Just because you cannot communicate doesn't mean that you can communicate to any extent and also get into binding agreements. Okay, uh, so these are two different extremes. In between these two extremes lie a whole number of sort of there's a huge gray region here in between. Okay, the gray region is where you know some amount of communication is allowed, some kind but binding agreements are not allowed or agreements are allowed, but mediators are not allowed, etc, etc. Various types of, uh, you know, exotic combinations are possible in between these two. And all of those are very interesting, very, uh, very, uh, very fascinating, but uh, also quite a bit of that remains open, ok. So, it is not, full, uh, you know, fully resolved either, as well. But these two being extreme cases in, in science, it is often the case that when you cannot solve a general problem, but you can solve corner cases. The corner cases of uh, are uh, become the way you to anchor your further theory. So, these are extreme cases that have been fairly well resolved now, ok. So, most for most part of the course, we will actually focus on only non-cooperative games, ok. So, the are uh, uh, I will we will uh, we will consider games of uh, of various kinds that are, uh, but all of them will have a non-cooperative flavor. Yeah. No, no. So, a cooperative, are cooperative games uh, mere optimization problems? Not necessarily, ok. Uh, so, uh, because of course, they can be posed as optimization problems, but so one uh, and one of the uh, criteria for the solution, uh, solution of a game. Uh, in a cooperative setting is uh, is that they, uh, there is some kind of a uh, let us say a, um, a, a, a combined optimal being asked for ok, but that is not the only that is not the only criteria ok. So, see for example, the, the particular uh, emphasis here is their issue of binding agreements right. So, again this is a slight digression, but I will just mention this. This, this is an important issue because I, we need to also factor in into our way of reasoning about the game. What, 
when we reason about this, we need to factor in what happens if there is no agreement reached. So, what is the disagreement fallback option that both players have? Once you factor that in, it becomes a much more sophisticated thing than just you know trying to do a collective sum, you know, optimization of the sum of the pairs. So, it is not a straightforward optimization. No, no, not necessarily. So, this is part. So, so, uh, if they can enter into binding agreements, they need not, right. So, what happens if they do not agree is, is, is something that they are always mindful of while, while trying to agree, right. So, this is part of the, uh, part of the, uh, part of the way we go about reasoning about this game. Again, so, I should also mention since we are on this topic, so, I should also mention another another thing here. See, cooperative versus non-cooperative doesn't necessarily mean conflict or non-conflict. Okay, so cooperate cooperation, non-cooperation when non a non-cooperative game just means that players cannot communicate, but it doesn't mean that there is necessarily a conflict in the in the game. All right. So they cannot communicate with each other, but that doesn't mean they are out to you know kill each other. It does not mean the uh, that there is a there is a conflict in the game. So, for example, an, a, a game where uh, where, uh, where there is no conflict, but there is still you can still think of it as a non cooperative situation is is a game where uh, industry standards are being decided. Okay. Now, industry associations are usually have uh, you have industry associations for each segment, you know there will be a, an association that uh, that creates say the hardware, another association that makes the software, but unless they there is they agree on a standard, they will not they will not be able to each get the best uh, uh, best outcome for both of them. So, for example, like um, so, you, uh, for you guys probably this is not, uh, you, you are probably not as exposed to this, but there was a time when, when, when CD drives and DVD drives were being introduced, what should be the, the radius of such a drive, the physical radius? Someone has to define this standard, right, that it is 3.3 and half centimeters or something like that is the radius. That has to, that is, so CD, the CD manufacturer may prefer one kind of radius, the, 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 the one who uh, the makes the uh, the reader of that drive would prefer another type of radius. They would each want to arrive at some uh, uh, some standard because unless they work together, they, nobody is going to be able to use either of their devices. So they have to coordinate on a certain standard. So coordination is is important, but then they, uh, they the situation could very well be non -coop, uh, non cooperative in the sense that they don't want to be able want to be discussing with each other because they will be end up ending up revealing what what uh, you know say for example their weak points or something like that okay so a situation where uh, where industry wide standards are being determined is a situation which is often non cooperative in nature but there is no underlying conflict involved okay Likewise, cooperative does not mean that everything is uh, um, you know uh, there is bonhomie either. Cooperative could also there could be conflict alongside cooperation for example, co uh, cooperative games. So, a cooperative game with conflict is a game say for example, uh, all these geopolitical conflicts in which uh, people are trying to uh, 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 trying to come up with an agreement on say what should be the border or and so on and so forth. These are actually situations of conflict. All right, but you but you are uh, you are trying to but it is because you are discussing and because there is there is eventually a pact to be signed and so on. This is actually a is a, a a cooperative game. Okay, so so neither of these is true. So cooperative doesn't mean. So the correct way to put it is cooperative game doesn't mean cooperation necessarily. Is not doesn't is not equal to no conflict. Okay, so now with with this, now I think we can start with a formal definition of what a what a game is. So this is of course a simple simple definition because I am not uh, I have not yet introduced any exotic aspects of games. 